I love you. <laughs> and I love speaking about food, and I love, um, and I think eating healthy food tastes great and is pleasurable and makes your life more enjoyable. And I like the, that interaction between like intellectually knowing what you're eating is good for you and having it make food to make it taste great at the same time. So you're eating delicious food that's also good for you. It just is really, um, and, the, and to remove your fear of disease, that you know you're not gonna have happen to you what happens to other Americans. Who would want to live a life like that? You know, especially when you know you don't have to have heart attacks and strokes and get demented and get cancer. Who would want to eat that garbage and go and then have a life in, with, with, with fear and tragedy and horrible things happen to people? It's just, it's sad. They declared it unnecessary. Welcome back to the Longevity Deprocess channel. Oh. Today we will learn from Dr. Joel Foreman, a leading expert in nutritional medicine, renowned physician, and best-selling author. Dr. Foreman has spent decades researching the powerful connection between diet and health, with a focus on how the right foods can prevent heart disease and even reverse chronic diseases. In this video, Dr. Foreman is introducing you to the groundbreaking concepts of the Nutritarian Diet as developed by Dr. Foreman. This diet, a daily meal plan, can help eliminate heart disease. The Nutritarian Diet is a plant-rich, nutrient-dense approach to eating that emphasizes the importance of maximizing the nutritional value of every calorie consumed. Unlike the standard American diet, SAD, which is typically high in processed foods, unhealthy fats, and added sugars, the Nutritarian Diet prioritizes whole. Natural foods that are packed with vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. This approach not only supports weight loss and overall health, but also significantly reduces the risk of developing diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Dr. Foreman is also a vocal critic of the over-reliance on pharmaceutical drugs to manage chronic conditions. Oh, a quick favor. We'd greatly appreciate it if you can subscribe and like. This helps the YouTube algorithm recognize the value of our content and share it more widely. While medications often address symptoms, they don't tackle the root causes of diseases, including heart disease, which are frequently linked to poor dietary habits. The Nutritarian Diet, on the other hand, focuses on healing the body from within by providing the nutrients needed to repair and protect cells, reduce inflammation, and strengthen the immune system. In today's video, we'll delve into what makes the Nutritarian diet so unique and effective. We'll explore how it differs from the typical standard American diet diet, the dangers of relying on drugs to manage diseases, and the remarkable medical benefits that come from embracing a Nutritarian lifestyle. Whether you're looking to improve your health, prevent disease, or explore a more natural approach to well-being, Dr. Foreman's insights and the Nutritarian diet could be the game changer you've been searching for. Let's dive in and discover the path to a healthier, more vibrant life with Dr. Joel Foreman's Nutritarian diet. Okay, so to, re to review now, because I want to make sure that you guys are understanding the concepts of a nutritarian diet. I focus on superfoods, some of these salient features of foods, their nutrient density. I want your diet to be vegetable-based. I want most, that means the majority of what you eat. By, at least by volume, should be vegetables, probably by calories too. But the majority of what you vegetable-based. The American diet is plant-based because the majority of what Americans are eating now is plants. They only eat 30% of calories from animal products. It's just most of the plants they eat are processed foods. Processed plants, like Coca-Cola and French fries and potato chips are plants, come from plants, right? So a nutritarian diet and the American diet is grain-based. Most of the calories come from grains. Not that we can't eat any whole grains, but I want you to eat more vegetables, mostly vegetables, because they have more powerful longevity benefits. And I want you to eat a lot of fruits, beans, nuts, and seeds. What I'm saying, these three basic factors, right? I'm saying to you that these are things that all nutritional scientists can't disagree with. There's 90% of the non-biased, non-commercial interested, you know, people who have the you know, scientists who are not working for a commercial company or on their payroll that have no commercial interests, all agree that, we, that po modern populations do not eat sufficient produce. We have to eat much more produce and we have to eat less animal products. That's not controversial. There's no controversy or disagreement here among scientists. The controversy is among lay people, not among scientists. 
And there's no controversy that we shouldn't be eating high glycemic refined carbohydrates like white sugar and white flour. There's no controversy among scientists here. And I agree. We all agree. What else is wrong about the standard American diet diet? Oil is also calorically dense and fattening. And, you're not gonna, and a lot of people on plant-based diets, which, you know, are eating a lot of oil, and the average American is consuming 400 calories from oil a day. That's a huge amount of concentrated calories that have no significant micronutrient load. The more calories you put in your body without a nutri nutritional load, the more it weakens your health and shortens your lifespan. Because think about this, I'm telling you that the health benefits of walnuts and flax seeds and pistachio nuts, right? I'm telling you about how beneficial it is to eat these nuts and seeds. The whole point is supposed to eat those nuts and seeds instead of using the oil, not to use it on top of the oil. Make your salad dressing with nuts and seeds, make your sauces and your dips with nuts and seeds. Utilize them and get the oil out of your diet because oil is processed in a way to that the calories are rapidly absorbed so fast into the bloodstream that they have to be stored as fat. You can't burn them for energy because too much of the calories rush in and too concentrated to form. What else can someone on a standard American diet diet do? And animal products, if you're going to eat them, have to be used sparingly. And I say, you know, like maximum maybe 8 to 10 ounces a week, maybe 6 to 8 ounces for a woman, 8 to 10 for a man, if you use it as a condiment, as a flavoring. You know, if a person is a meat lover, they don't want to give up animal products no matter what, then they can eat as a little bit of animal product. You know, even some people, so in other words, even those people who, are, who will never be a vegan, they still should cut back their animal products radically. Did you follow that? Why should they commit suicide with food over, over wrong information? Because if you don't want to give up your beef, you can still have a beef burger with one ounce of beef in it. It could be made out of mushrooms and oats and beans and walnuts ground together. You know, you could take a, a four ounce piece of beef and make it for eight people or eight burgers and you could put it on the barbecue. Make sure you have a lot of heterocyclic amines to make it more carcinogenic, of course. <laughs> but the point is, is that these people can use animal products as a condiment or a flavoring if they don't want to give it up and they still don't want to sit down and put a big section of that animal right on their plate and eat it, a big, poor, big giant piece of it because you don't want to make it the main point of what you're eating because it's going to take out away from the amount of foods you should be eating. Besides the fact that it has disease-promoting effects, it also reduces, by, by your percent of calories, you have to get it relatively low so you can have a room in your stomach to eat all the healthy foods you need to eat, right? It's called replacement. That's where the studies on saturated fat, where people are saying that saturated fat is good, not bad. It's good to eat butter now, right? Butter is back. Bacon is back, right? Because the studies show that when people cut back the fat in their diet and ate more refined carbohydrates, like white flour products like bagels and bread, their heart disease rates didn't go, didn't go down. They went up. That doesn't, um, what's the word, absolve butter of being dangerous or bacon of being dangerous just because one other, because sugar is worse. Did you follow that? Because one thing is, more because things are equally bad doesn't make it good. It's like buying a car by comparing it to a junkyard wreck. You know, we have to, in other words, they're both bad. The whole, it's, it's half of nutritional science is crazy because they don't even know what the, the people doing the studies don't even know what to study. They're so, they, they're studying the wrong things, you know. Seeing whether it's better to use oil or whether to use, to use oil versus white flour or, you know, or, or it's, it's crazy. Crazy. What do we focus on? So we have to focus on nutrient-dense calories, and oil is a perfect example of a nutrient-poor calorie, right? All oil. You don't have to ask me about flax oil, coconut oil, olive oil, oil from the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever oil you can mention, it's all mostly calorically dense, 120 calories per tablespoon with no significant nutrient load. So more greens, more beans, more nuts and seeds in the diet, right? means less animal products and less carbohydrates, less highly refined carbohydrates. More beans, more greens, more nuts and seeds means dramatic lowering of the glycemic effect of the diet. And as I explained to you, biochemical effects that it reduce the glycemic effect of other foods and they dramatically improve diabetic parameter. So here's a study, a pilot study we did on, on 11 people who were on, a, who were on a nutritarian diet for seven months and they lost weight. They're, they all became non-diabetic 
In other words, their hemoglobin A1C, the non-diabetic range is below six. And even the one who was left on glucophage had a hemoglobin A1C below, five, below six. His doctor just left him on it. He didn't need it anymore. He was just left on it. But they all essentially became non-diabetic. Look at how much their blood pressure dropped. 60% of, um, of blood pressure medications were reduced over that seven-month period. And more of them should have been reduced. But their blood pressure dropped about 27 points. And of course, their triglycerides dropped 70 points. In other words, they generally they became normal again. They lost their weight, they got rid of their diabetes. Pretty easy to get rid of their diabetes on this study. And now we're doing a larger control trial, which I'm really excited about. Because of this, the, um, Andrew Bremer, the head of Di NIH, the head of diabetes section NI at the National Institute of Health, um, in communication with him on the phone, very super nice guy. He eats a healthy, he eats a nutritarian diet. He's excited about doing studies and, having the, and, and supporting and being part of doing studies that can show the benefits of a diet. He said to me once, we know drugs don't work. You know, we know drugs don't. We've tested it for 40 years. You know, we know that that's, it's not the answer. Matter of fact, drugs cause weight gain for diabetics. They make people get more diabetic because they, they push the failing beta cells in the pancreas, the sulfonylureas, push the beta cells in the pancreas to work harder to produce more insulin. The failing beta cells that are overworked to begin with are now being pushed harder to get your glucose down. So by trying to push your glucose down, now they burn out faster. And you become more diabetic. And that's why the Accord study was stopped after a few years because the people who were getting more medical care and more blood glucose measurements and better, better medical care and to keep their blood glucose was better controlled and lower had a higher risk, of higher risk of morbidity and mortality, higher risk of death. So the government had to stop the study. More drugs, more death. Just death. I'm not interested in more death. Yes. What other drugs do you not recommend taking? Statins, too, in Crete cause are linked to weight gain and, and worsening of diabetic parameters. Taking drugs to, to try to improve people's numbers don't absolve them from having future heart attacks. It doesn't take away their diseases. Even, their diseases are even advancing more rapidly on the drugs. You know how the, diet, the statin drugs can cause people to have muscle aches and to break down muscle tissue. And sometimes the breakdown of muscle tissue can affect the kidney and the liver, too. Seriously so, right? But here's the thing I want you to remember. For all those people who are taking statin drugs, with millions and millions of people across America, to try to lower their cholesterol, and instead of eating right, you think just because they don't feel the muscle breakdown and don't see it in their bloodstream, they're not getting some small degree of muscle damage and cellular damage from using those statin drugs all the time? Sure they are. And you know what's a muscle? Your heart's a muscle. What happens after 10 or 15 years of use of these drugs that may have had to maybe that weakened the heart muscle or destroyed heart tissue over time? Maybe with people who are prone to heart disease, maybe it increases the risk of heart failure. And that's what studies are starting to show today. And people are starting to question this, that over long term, many years of use, these drugs have side effects that we're not even familiar with yet. Dr. Foreman will now cite some research on drug side effects. Like, for example, a recent study showed on women with calcium channel blockers, low blood pressure, had over, um, a ten, over more than a 10-year period, had double the risk of breast cancer from using the calcium channel blocker, using the drug. And the, the doctors, or the scientists writing in the conclusion of this paper, wrote that we're not saying that all doctors should stop prescribing these drugs and change the way they practice. What we're saying is that more studies need to be done to ascertain the precision of these risks. What? What did they just say? I thought we learned in medical school, first do no harm. I, I thought, but they're what they're, I'll, I'll, I'll interpret that for you. That means just give patients drugs, whether you, know, whether, you know how, whether you know how dangerous they are or not. We'll find that out later, for sure. Just give them drugs, because it's better to do something than to do nothing. That's what it means, I guess. So, what can we do about it? But, you know, but now put that in the context of the fact that nutritional excellence has the ability to work better than drugs and give people the opportunity. See, if people really knew the dangers of those drugs, if they knew that their blood pressure medication caused breast cancer, could double the risk of breast cancer, and they also knew they could reverse their blood pressure so easily with dietary change without incurring those risks, don't you think more people would choose to eat healthfully if they were really properly informed? So here's, you know, I had a med student rotating through my practice, and he noticed in one day, we had five patients in one day who dropped their cholesterol about, their LDL, their bad cholesterol about, you know, almost 100 points. 
He said, wow, we had, you had six follow-up patients that you saw six weeks ago, and every person dropped their cholesterol huge. It was like amazing. And of course, that was with one of them, stopped the cholesterol only drug and dropped it. And this is what you see, you see dramatic effects. And this was done and published in a medical journal, Metabolism, where they followed people following a nutritarian diet. And just six weeks, it dropped their cholesterol 33%, their, their, um, it dropped their LDL cholesterol 33% just in six weeks' time. More powerful than statin drugs in general practice. Wow, that's, that's a lot. Are there any other benefits of using nutrition over drugs? But here's the thing to know, to note, that when you lowered your cholesterol with, your nut with, with nutrition, it just didn't lower your cholesterol. It lowered your body weight, it lowered your glycemic parameters, it improved, it got rid of your inflammation, it, and it's not just cholesterol, it's oxidized LDL cholesterol. It's the inflammatory cholesterol, and then your, the ratio of oxidized to non-oxidized completely changed. It doesn't, you, you're not representing the benefits just by looking at the LDL cholesterol. The benefits might be 100 times more protective. When the, you follow what I'm saying right now? You, it's, it's a false sense of security. About half of Americans, actually it's more like 40% of Americans die of heart attacks and strokes, but people on statin drugs, about 40, 50% of them die of heart attacks too. They're not, it's not wiping out their risk, even with the low cholesterol. That's just one of many risk factors. Even when they work and lower your cholesterol, you're not suddenly protected against having a heart attack because you're on a statin drug. It's just a complete myth. The doctor will now talk about another drug and its side effects. And high blood pressure medications have other dangerous effects. There's two, there's two numbers when you get a high blood pressure, right? There's two numbers that go up and two numbers that go down. The top number is called the systolic number and the bottom number is called the diastolic number. You guys have heard of that, right? The systolic number represents the amount of pressure on the wall of the blood vessels when the heart compresses or squeezes. That's called systole. Push, when the blood is pushed out to the whole body, the blood vessels peripherally expand to take that blood. They mo they're mobile. The walls of the blood vessels move in and out. And as they're under pressure during systole, they move out a little bit. If they don't move, if they're more stiffened, systole, the systolic blood pressure goes up very high. If they're supposed to, if they're elastic and youthful, and they widen as the part, part pumps, the first blood pressure stays relatively low. So the systolic blood pressure is a measure of how elastic and youthful and healthy your blood vessels are. Did you follow that? During diastole, when the heart relaxes and refills, the blood vessels do what? They contract inward to keep diastole up so it can help the blood return back to the heart. If you're elderly and the blood vessels are more stiff and dis diseased and they don't come in, then diastole starts to fall. As you age, the, the top number goes higher and the bottom number goes lower, your pulse pressure widens and that's the predictor of sudden cardiac death or danger because let me ask you a question. When does the heart blood vessels, the coronary arteries that bring the blood to the muscle of the heart, when does those vessels fill with blood? During systole or during diastole? During diastole is correct. They refill when the heart refills. And so you get all that oxygen blood during diastole. Now, so what am I telling you this for? It seems kind of advanced and unnecessary. I'll tell you why I'm telling you it. Because when you take drugs to lower your blood pressure, to push the systolic number into a favorable range, they can't even do it with one drug in most of these people who are eating American food. They sometimes require two or three drugs, but, the, but you, when you raise the dose of that drug or add a second drug and, and you take, go to doctors, they give you sufficient drugs to keep the systolic number favorable so it doesn't cause a stroke or damage brain cells, but they do so at the expense of pushing diastole into an unfavorable low range. So we know that people with a diastole below 60 have a three times risk of cardiac death and people below 70 have double the risk of cardiac death. And as when you medicate a diastolic number low, it's dangerous. It's not dangerous when it's low because you just earned it to be low because you, like you have a youthful blood vessels, but when you medicate blood pressure down, you increase risk of sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrhythmia, and a lot of these blood pressure medications cause people to go into atrial fibrillation because they don't sufficiently get coronary refilling during diastole. And now they're in atrial fibrillation from the blood pressure medications, and now you've got to get take you know, a clot-busting drug like Kamumadin or another drug which increases risk of hemorrhagic stroke and gastrointestinal bleeding, or you get an accident and you bleed to death. You know, in other words, or the drugs have actually the one drug causes one side effect, and they give you another drug to counter that side effect, so now you're taking the, the anti the blood thinners, and so now you're taking the proton pump inhibitors because they cause irritation of the stomach, and then you get the proton pump inhibitor, which decreases acid, which increases risk of pneumonia. So now you've got increased risk of pneumonia infections, so now they give you 
antibiotics for that, and then they got to, what I'm saying is that taking one drug leads to a taking of another drug to counter the effects of the other drug. No, I can't repeat it. I don't even know what I just said. Dr. Foreman will now describe the idea of working for good health. But the point I'm making here is that drugs aren't the answer. The point I'm making is if people knew had a good, had, could a good evaluation, properly informed of the risks of medications and their limited benefits and how, you, and how the really only true benefits they could get out of really changing their diet. And now you can drop the diet, the systolic blood pressure, without pushing the diastolic too low. And you can not just cover it up, cover up the numbers on your blood pressure, like beta blockers, which lower peripheral blood pressure, but don't change central nervous system blood pressure in the brain much. It's just like covering it up. I always say you take your car to the mechanic with the oil light flashing on the dashboard, and he reaches in there with a, with a wire cutters, and he snips the wire so you can't see your oil light flashing, right? You still, then you're driving your car with no oil. You can't escape from the biological laws of cause and effect. You can't take a drug and expect to be okay when you have these factors. When I tell audiences, I say, how many people want to guarantee never to have a heart attack and never have a stroke? And they all raise their hand and say, me, I do, I want. Tell me, I'm going to do it. And I'm saying, so, well, well, you can't just, here's what you got to do. You have to have a normal blood pressure without the use of medication. If you're requiring medication to lower your blood pressure, you're not protected. I'm not giving you a guarantee if you're not requiring medication. You have to have a normal cholesterol without the use of medication. If you're trying drugs to do it, you're not protected. You have to have normal glucose parameters without the use of medication. You have to have a normal body weight. You have to have a normal exercise tolerance. You've got to earn good health. It's not given to you. You can't buy it. You can't pop a pill for it. You've got to work for it. Eat good food. The doctor will now talk about another study about the effects of a nutritarian diet. So here's a study which shows blood pressure change of 105 people following a nutritarian diet. And what's interesting to me was seeking at this, wow, they dropped their blood pressure about 25 points on it. Don't forget, medications only drop blood pressure about 10, to 10 points, right? 10 millimeters of mercury, mercury. The DASH study, the high, low sodium DASH study, where they gave them drop blood pressure an average of 12 points mercury, which is as good as medication, it's pretty good. But of course, this is double, more than double that. But look at the people who are 80% compliant in orange. Even people didn't even follow it all the way, dropped their blood pressure pretty well. You know, maybe not as much, but the point is you got more benefits. But still, amazingly, I was shocked. Wow, 80% compliant still dropped their blood pressure almost 25 points. And here's a study on some hundreds of people following this program for weight loss, showing 90% of them, and the 90% adherent, they continue to lose weight, but they maintain the weight loss. The point is, it's not a fad diet, it's a health diet, right? You're doing it for good health, and if you learn it properly, because the science goes into your brain, the information becomes part of you, right? You're not just doing it to lose weight. The people that succeed with this program are people that learn it the best. They can regurgitate it, they studied it. I've studied this, I've studied that the better, if I can track who succeeds and who fails, I can always find the people who could pass an exam or become the experts are the people who succeed because they know the most information because the scientific information supports and motivates them to stay on this and makes them enjoy it more. They know they're doing it for a reason, not just doing it to lose weight cosmetically. Next, watch the Dr. Joel Foreman Club playlist for more information on the nutritarian diet. Thanks for watching Longevity Deprocessed. Hit like, share, and subscribe to stay updated on evidence-based longevity tips. Share your thoughts in the comments, your journey matters. Remember, small daily habits create big changes. Until next time, keep deprocessing for a healthier, longer future. Let's make this journey together.